Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, very interesting talk by Professor Davies before. I think it's a good follow up uh, to our startup portion of the event. Uh, I think a lot of these startups will, will illustrate some of the things that uh, Professor Davies mentioned about, about being nimble, being agile, and uh, being brave in, in, in changing and responding to what's going on. So I'm pretty very excited to bring you today's session with 10 of our MIT startups. First, I tell you a bit about the MIT Startup Exchange, how it can help you to connect to our 1900 MIT startups, in addition to the ones you see today. Then I'll go over today's agenda. So at the MIT Startup Exchange was created by ILP like yourselves to better connect MIT startups to industry. We have 1900 startups now they either since MIT technology or were founded by MIT faculty, staff, student alumni. We know these startups very well. We also know our 250 IOP members very well. This enables us to make hundreds of effective introductions every year. It's really a great member benefit for you to take advantage of. And here are some of our success stories where our IOP members have entered into partnerships with our startups as early customers strategic partners, or corporate venture investors. You see these ILP companies come from different industries and all over the world. So a lot of different great success stories. Here are some of the different technologies our startups cover. Most requested by our corporates include AI and machine learning, data analytics, not surprising, a lot of uh, digital startups. Uh, we also see growing interest in healthcare, IoT and sensor, advanced materials, and a big one recently is uh, sustainability, so sustainable materials. So how can you best engage with these MIT startups? Great question. One way is by doing what you're already doing, coming to events like today's. Today we are here from 10 different startups for a few minutes each, so you can get a sense of what they do and see about interest in having follow-up meetings to discuss partnerships. We have, uh, also our Stex 25 industry ready startups that will be unveiling uh, July 21st and 23rd. Uh, I should mention, we actually do also have a poll that we uh, meant to uh, get going here, which is about uh, asking you about your interest in working with our MIT startups. It would be great if you could uh, answer that. Uh, the other part of what MIT Startup Exchange does is opportunity postings. You can actually post an opportunity to our 1900 startups. You can pick the topic and describe a bit of the, about the specific challenge that you might have. And the startups can apply to directly work with you. So they can self-select to work with you. I can tell you that over the course of the last two months, we're seeing growing interest in opportunity postings. So do take advantage of those if you're interested as well. All right. Uh, now, uh, onto our startups. Uh, in terms of the agenda today, we have two parts. The first part is five startups around customer engagement. And what you see is we have uh, these five startups uh, covering different aspects of customer engagement, followed by a Q&A with the startups. And the second part of this is uh, HR and partnerships. I will mention that for Ref Analytics and Humanize, Speaking of startups adapting quickly to what's going on, um, they actually study uh, or, or help uh, industries address some of the challenges we have in terms of now today, all of us are working from home. So they have some interesting data to share uh, around that. How do video conferencing work and how does organization health be affected? According to Dojo, unfortunately, won't be joining us because the speaker, Richard, uh, uh, just got sick. Uh, but the, all the other startups will be here with us. So please do submit your questions using the Q&A button. You will, you will uh, be able to hear these uh, answered uh, during the Q&A part of the, uh, today's event. Use the chat button only if you're, you have technical questions to ask of our team. We also have a link for you, bit.ly slash management startups 2020, big M, big S, where you can select startups you're interested in following up with. I know it's a lot of info uh, at once, uh, so I'm going to give you a chance to sink, have that sink in. Before we move on to the uh, startups, the first one up today being Endor, one of our five customer engagement startups. So good morning, good afternoon to everyone. 
I'm Thomas Solovich with Endor. We are a predictive analytics platform um, that was initiated at MIT by the guidance of Professor Pentland and Dr. Yaniv Altschuler. We're going to talk about innovation and management and the aspect of human behavior. And how does artificial intelligence and predictive analytics really help the organization proceed and move forward? In every day of our life, specifically in times like this, targeting the right audience for any purpose, whether it is to sell a loan, to sell a product, even hire the right people, requires tons of skills and capabilities that range from data that you get or technology that you have access to. The problem lies in the aspect of how do you actually create those models when we're trying to build machine learning models and using many technologies, the process is very cumbersome. It takes you from asking a business to getting the data, cleaning the data, and really a very lengthy process that in times like this requires a lot of uh, innovation, creativity. And to be honest, in times of pandemic, um, past information really doesn't help us because the world is changing so fast. What we've also found is that there is a need to understand human behavior. Most of our current models and capabilities rely on statistical understanding of age, gender, salaries, and everything that we know about our customers. But honestly, it's very hard to create a model based on um, getting stuck in traffic or missing a flight or getting laid off because of COVID-19. Understanding human behavior and making it a part of our prediction capability is what we're trying to achieve, is changing the way of looking at things and motivating you to really think differently as you're innovating in your organization. What we've created at MIT under the guidance of Professor Pentland is the ability to look at the new science, is the ability to crunch human behavior data, transaction that comes from uh, your mobile application, taxi rides, Uber, anything that you have that implies what it is that we do and create clustering of human behavior. This will allow us to find out commonalities. We all understand now that although we don't know who next to us behaves similarly, we all have shared very similar experiences. We have a range of customers that range from financial services to defense and retail, and we can see a great growth within the adoption of predictive analytics as it grows to human behavior. We can find more loans, we can increase capabilities, we can find terrorists. Very similarly, because we can use the data and understand how those organizations, how behaviors of individuals changes or create commonalities. The system is a software as a service, it's an application. We basically took the science that's called social physics and apply it into a platform that works ability to work in the system and really get access to your data. The goal is to transform the organization from a data science organization into a business-driven organization that gives you access to immediate changes in the market and understanding that the customer of last week might move the same next week. We have a very short period of time, but I think it's important to know that we're looking for partners from multiple different regions um, around financial services, retail, and defense, folks that are in technology that want to partner with us and really want to take advantage of this new science and capability that allow you to take advantage of real-time predictive analytics of artificial intelligence. I appreciate you taking the time and allowing me to present and we'll be here to ask any question about any and all kind of data. Thank you very much. I'm Arun Prakash. I'm the CFO of Cerebri AI. I'm an MIT Sloan alum and our CTO is also an MIT PhD. We are an AI for a customer experience company, also called CX. Uh, we have a platform for enterprises, and we're based in Austin, Texas, with offices in Toronto and Washington, DC. So the problem of CX today is uh, for, for consumers who go to their lifestyle brands, such as financial services, insurance, telecom, media, luxury retail, automotive, all have a a new problem of going not only the old way of single channel, but transitioning into what we call omni-channel. And that just doesn't mean you go to multiple uh, places like a store or a mobile phone to do your um, commerce, but the data that exists between these channels also talks to each other to give you the same experience, the same offer, whatever you need in any channel you happen to be in. And that, that's the challenge of, of omni-channel that is gonna be facing enterprises uh, in the future, and we're here to solve that problem. 
Uh, the way we do that is we focus on um, customer journeys and interactions. We don't uh, look at personas and demographics to drive what's going to happen to a customer, but we uh, take that data and put it together and build those customer journeys so we can understand true customer engagement and apply artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and reinforcement learning to those journeys so that you can get uh, better insights than just old, old school business rules. Our software looks like this for the user. It's very friendly to the, the revenue side of the business, whether you're a marketer uh, looking at a scale up of uh, a, a cohort to send a campaign to, uh, whether you're a service agent speaking to an individual customer or a sales agent speaking to an individual customer, or you're using our APIs to deliver the solutions in real time on your, on your digital commerce site. So what we have in technology um, today to understand customers, they like to ask the customer, what do you think? They ask their NPS score. And we don't uh, believe that's the best way to go. So we built an NPS killer called the Cerebri Value, which is a real time measure of near term spend of a customer. We measure engagement in dollars or local currency, and it helps to predict if they're going to churn, upsell, cross sell, do a specific action. We also recommend what actions to take uh, in sequence for customers so that you can drive the results that you want. And this is all back ended by a 10 stage software pipeline that ingests data, uh, makes it understandable, and delivers it through uh, APIs as well. Uh, some customers we've worked with who worked in the auto space. Uh, helping a global auto OEM with marketing campaigns in a certain region, driving two and a half times lift and selling a lot of cars uh, and services. We've also worked with the bank in North America on lending, and we've used our system to automatically adjudicate uh, loans so that they can uh, better win the business. Uh, we bring in a lot of risk and economics as well to our customer journeys because those are critical for customers when they think about how they're going to do their future spend. Uh, in terms of working with us, we help uh, all sorts of use cases, but primarily engagement, churn, upsell, cross-sell, and we also do macroeconomic forecasting. We've worked with the central bank, a leading central bank in the world on their forecasting, uh, a variety of industries around lifestyle brands, and we can get piloted and onboarded in 60 to 90 days. So we'd love to partner with uh, those who want to use this technology or integrators who want to resell this technology to their enterprise clients. Thank you. Cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. My name is Alan Ringwald. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Relativity6. Uh, MIT Sloan grad started the company in 2016 as a collaboration uh, with myself, some classmates, uh, faculty, and professors. Uh, you guys have heard uh, and will continue to hear a lot of different AI approaches. Uh, in our case, we really decided it was important to focus on specific behaviors, um, and specifically, we we spent our time and research on understanding repurchasing and renewal behavior. So everything to do with um, churn. Just some quick reasons why our technology has been working for the last four years and we believe our customers are happy. The first is we're actually able to pick up the, sh the shopping signal or the churn signal well in advance of someone actually leaving. So typically it's two to three months in advance, but can go all the way up to six months. Um, another really key feature is that we're able to predict when someone's behavior can actually change. So if you think about needing to prioritize an agent or broker's time, really important feature there. Um, and I think the, the real key thing that brings it all together is the fact that our AI isn't um, just really accurate, but it's um, genuinely very understandable and actionable. So the non-technical people that have to take action on the predictions can do so easily. Um, as you see here, uh, we mainly have been working in financial services, um, insurance companies, banks, but certainly have customers in retail, aviation, and others as well. In terms of results, uh, typically we get about a 90% accuracy rate um, on our churn models, which lead to about a half a percent to 1% reduction in churn. And the stat that we really optimize for and care about is a quarterly uplift. Um, in, in, in general, it's about a 5% uplift. And what's cool is, you know, these results can happen in weeks, not months or years. Um, and we're typically about 10x cheaper um, than an internal team solution. Quickly want to highlight a case study with Willis Towers Watson, recently acquired by Aon, so really large insurance brokerage firm. With them, um, just want to tell you about how we operationalize some of our machine learning and AI. So uh, we, we basically, when we started, it was a weekly data transfer. 
we, we got weekly predictions. And what was really interesting is we did weekly intuition testing of the brokers themselves. These are the frontline people. Um, these are the people that know the customer best. So it was really important to start understanding how they work and how well they know their customer. Um, so we actually stood up uh, what we call a proactive predictive churn CRM for this specific client. As you'll see here, there is a traffic light system. So we would make predictions, but we would actually let the brokers override those predictions with what they thought would happen next. So it was really kind of a human machine relationship where we're able to observe their behavior, learn which brokers had the best intuition, and actually use that as a, as a new data point for the next week's predictions. Uh, in terms of results, uh, the first month that we were actually in operation, we got a 6.5% uplift um, in quarterly revenue, and 80% of the customers that we tagged as at risk, they were actually able to save. By the second quarter in operation, we got up to an 11% uplift in quarterly revenue, um, and uh, sorry, in quarterly revenue, and an, up to an 87% um, save save rate. So 87% of the customers that uh, we tagged as being at risk, they were actually able to save. Um, excited to chat more with you guys. I know this was really fast, but would love to talk more about our technology and see if we can actually get a partnership going. Thank you guys so much. All right. Well, my name is Anuj Bala, and I'm the CEO of Service Mob. Today, we're going to talk about a better way to interact with customer service providers. Uh, the frustration on this woman's face probably says everything. Uh, has this been you in the last day, week, month, or year? Contacting customer service, as we all know, <clears throat> is a very frustrating experience. We navigate through menus, wait on hold forever, and we hope to get to a person that can solve our problem. But on the other side, operating the contact center is difficult as well. Customers contact at concentrated times, right after lunch, right after work. They always, uh, contact center operators are always trying to maintain service levels and it's hard to staff due to choppy and unpredictable demand, both on the labor supply side and the contact demand side. It's a broken system altogether. Uh, 13 hours, that's the average number. Uh, every man, woman, and child waits on hold for customer service every year. And 450, uh, powerful number, 450 billion, that's the amount contact centers spend worldwide on overstaffed labor. So customers are waiting for service, but contact centers are, are overstaffed? How is, how is that possible? The opportunity is really that most contact centers are overstaffed. That is a true statement, just not when most people call. That's why we wait. Service Mob is here to answer that question and, and solve that with, with AI and machine learning. What our tech does is it load balances that demand. We're able to use machine learning to create a series of micro forecasts on hundreds of attributes of you know, who the agent is, how uh, initial and repeat calls come in, the contact intensity, the time between repeat calls based on who that customer is. And we're able to aggregate that into a much more powerful forecast. We're taking a forecasting econometric method that's been used for probably the last 50 years and revamping that into something way more powerful and way more accurate at the 15 minute interval level. We do it and we don't br break capacity constraints. Less headcount is required because we're able to meet the same demand. And in real time, as customers are calling in, we can shift their demand to better times of day because we're able to accurately predict the peaks and troughs of the day in that demand. And as a result, uh, we're three to five X more predictive in terms of accuracy than the best models on the market today. And our platform is visual. It's changing the way we access support. So in addition to, instead of the, uh, to do this, press one, to do that, press two, we have visual tree menus that are much more seamless and effortless. We can use biometric authentication to seamlessly get into and access customer service. We you know, handle omni-channel adoption across calls, chats, traditional channels, but also untraditional channels like SMS, tweets, or Facebook. And then we also enable tetherless waiting so that for any company, if they use our technology, you never have to wait on hold again. Uh, our results are amazing. We're working with, with many companies across, uh, across industries. 
But, uh, you know, this example is with Clover Health. This is a, a unicorn uh, based out of San Francisco, um, you know, $5 billion healthcare company. Uh, we helped them deflect $7.3 million in costs. We improved their net promoter score by 36%. And we reduced their abandonment rate, even in their, their peak times for the end of the year, by over 80%. Uh, if you're looking to digitally transform your customer service, see us. Uh, we are working with uh, consumer goods, healthcare, travel and hospitality, software as a service businesses. Uh, if you're looking to digitally improve your, your customer service, come talk to us and we'd love to see what we can do to help you and partner with you. Thanks. Um, so Profitile is a cloud-based software solution uh, based on the insights from Dr. Jonathan Burns, uh, who's been teaching at MIT for the last 30 years. Uh, our solution allows companies to uncover the hidden profits by driving profitability down below the averages of the P&L uh, to the profitability of the invoice line level of every transaction. Acting on insights and recommendations from our solution, companies have been able to increase their profitability by at least 10% in the last 12 to 18, in, in 12 to 18 months. So if I get this to move. The speed and complexity of business is changing. COVID-19 is a great example of, of it's going even faster now. Um, and while many businesses um, have increased their capabilities like precision marketing, um, they have not kept up with the change with their P&L because the P&L hasn't really changed in over 200 years. It was designed by humans for humans in an age where averages were sufficient because prices were more uniform and complexity of the business uh, was much lower. In the digital age, it's critical to go below the averages of the traditional P&L and see the profitability being generated at the atomic level of the company at the invoice line level for every transaction. This is the only way you can see the true patterns of profitability and take focused actions. We've put over $100 billion of revenue through our model, and we can say with confidence that the old paradigms of gross margin are really not correlated to profit. This is a profit contour map which shows in green where the profit peaks are and in red where the profit valleys are. While this company was producing an average of 6% profitability, the contour map shows that the averages concealed under this or where critical patterns of profitability are is really the most important thing that you can find once you understand what's happening below the averages. And once you understand that, you can shift resources to where your profits are and begin to change your business models and reduce the resources that are being pulled into the profit drains. When we do this work, we actually use cluster analysis to look at the patterns. And we can look at these simultaneously across customer, operations, and product. And we'll look at all those combinations and spin this like a Rubik's Cube so we can look at every, every little piece of the business. And it turns out that the big opportunities and profitability are often at the edges. And making changes in those very focused areas has a huge impact on profitability. Oops, I went, went too fast. So um, this is a manufacturing case study. Um, we actually helped uh, about a $3 billion company uh, improve their profitability by 14% in 12 months. Uh, what we did was we helped them understand exactly where the profits were concentrated, helped them understand that their existing processes around SKU management uh, were the biggest opportunity. And then we helped them actually change those processes and created a feedback loop that engaged the sales organization uh, with an understanding of profitability, not just driving top line revenue and gross margin. We made sure that they had an ongoing capability to measure this, and they were able to use this to optimize and change their product mix in a changing market. We work with lots of different types of companies in manufacturing, distribution, and retail. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, now with the COVID-19 because companies need to see quickly how their markets are changing, and if they're using the averages of their legacy financial systems, they can't see and react fast enough. So we would hope to be able to work with you guys um, if, if, um, in the near future because we think we can help quite a bit. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. All right, here comes a fun part of uh, today's event, the uh, in interactive uh, panels. So uh, don't be shy if you have questions to ask of our startups. I know there's uh, been a lot to cover in a short time and there's a lot of data. 
So uh, please do um, uh, ask your questions. Um, you know, we, we all like to better understand what, what it is that they do. This is probably a hallmark of MIT startups, a lot of data, a lot of modeling. Um, so <laughs> or you probably have questions and, and just like, um, you know, whatever question you have, there are many others with questions. Great. Uh, to get started, uh, I'd like to ask our panelists, um, John, thank you so much for mentioning that with the COVID-19 and the, and the changes in, in demand. Um, so yeah, uh, a couple of things. Uh, what, what are some of the things you help? What are your, the biggest challenges you see with, uh, with your customers and how are things changing now with COVID-19? I would like to ask that of John, but also uh, any of us, uh, the panelists, feel free to pipe, pipe in. Sure, we are working with a lot of distributors and retailers and their demand patterns are completely uh, useless, which means that their uh, supply chain systems are malfunctioning pretty aggressively. Lots of extra inventory and not the inventory in the right places. Uh, we use our solution to help them concentrate on where to focus their manual interventions and make sure that they're focused on their most profitable SKUs and customers. And that's where they're putting their extra resources to recover from some of these very difficult uh, supply chain situations. And we're also helping them make sure that they're changing their business model for these other smaller customers and products so that it doesn't absorb all of their resources and, and get, leave them stuck with too much inventory. Very important problem. Uh, other panelists, uh, Tomer. Yeah, um, just one aspect on human behavior when we talk about customers. Um, seeing a different, you know, understanding how people behave today is different than how they use last week and even two months ago. So I think it's about understanding uh, those patterns in a really rapid moment uh, to really make the implication about what's coming up next. Models that we've learned for the last six years are almost useless because it's very hard to predict and use them. We've used recently, together with the Professor Pentland, a case of uh, exploring COVID-19 patient exposure within the Boston area and really trying to understand based on human behavior and patterns, can we predict the next outbreak? Can we find those patients two weeks in advance, which in a way is very similar to just, you know, looking at customers, purchases or anything around it. If you understand human behavior, you can do a lot with it from a medical perspective and from purchasing behavior. Great. Uh, Anush and then Arun. Yeah, <clears throat> one thing that's interesting is that it's <clears throat> like other panelists have said, um, you know, in this time of COVID, uh, especially demand for in like non in person services like customer service is up for many industries. Um, so, you know, whether you were traveling hospitality initially, you had a lot of cancellations, those types of things. <clears throat> but now you're getting more and more demand for, um, you know, things that you know normally people would do in person so overall we see demand going up for many industries but that combined with the fact that we have a lot of contact centers that are essentially operating in home-based models the the areas of productivity the areas of you know customer patterns that we looked at in the last few years those are those are you know, essentially useless, right? So we have to, you know, adjust the recency versus historiosity equation. And part of what, you know, we're able to help customers with is, is really navigate that. When you're dealing with a new customer demand pattern, when you're dealing with a new labor supply pattern, because now your operation gets disrupted, those are two factors that any one of those factors would be difficult, but both at the same time is, is now very hard. And, uh, you know, we, we're helping companies navigate through that uncertainty because, and this is, is precisely where things like machine learning and, you know, improved models versus just, you know, historical ARIMA contact rates. Um, those are the kinds of things people have been using in the past that are just proving to be inadequate during these times. Well, one thing that we've uh, had been integrating into our products since the early days is uh, macroeconomic models that, uh, impact customer journeys. And we were fortunate to be working with one of the largest central banks in the world um, for the last two years. And we've been predicting their nation's GDP uh, for the past four quarters. And um, you know, we've been uh, as accurate as the, their, uh, their equivalent of Wall Street. But the, um, the key thing is in their fourth quarter, they had a, a decrease in, in GDP, which we picked up on uh, ahead of the, the street. And this, this kind of gave us confidence that our models can pick up the changes faster. And, uh, and we've integrated this into our product so that 
uh, future customers, existing customers, such as you know commercial banks or insurers or auto companies who really care about the effects of macroeconomics and risk uh, on customers in, in changing environments. And especially now with, with the COVID-19 economic changes, uh, they're going to be ahead of the game. And so we call this digital economics and being ahead of what's going on economically. And that's a big change that's going to be uh, needed going forward in any case. Very good. Um, uh, great. Uh, Alan, I'll get back to you in a sec. Uh, so I just want to mention uh, earlier we ran a poll on what are uh, the interest of the folks attending in terms of uh, partnering up. And I thought it was pretty interesting that the poll result, because uh, it would flash by quickly, uh, not, not yet this poll, um, the first poll results. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting that um, the sixty-four percent of folks said they're either have talked to startups, they are um, they are trying to find match, or they're very excited to figure out ways to work with you. So I, I thought that was uh, great to highlight. So a lot of interest here. Um, so um, uh, I do want to present now the second poll, uh, which is what are focus current focus now in terms of engaging customers. Um, I think you see uh, all our panelists sort of come at it from different angle. Right, so that second uh, poll is probably uh, good for us to get a sense in as well. Are you? It's about finding new customers in this changing environment, upselling existing customers, or increasing customer satisfaction um, and, and uh, increasing profit, of, of course. Now, Alan, uh, go back. Yeah. Going back to you. No problem. I just kind of want to take a time out on like what we're talking about, and mm -hmm. uh, as someone who's been in the trenches for years, you can see by my big beard here, um, out in the the jungle of digital transformation with large enterprise. Um, the state of the data is actually really central to actually making all these beautiful transformational technologies, AI machine, machine learning actually work. Um, but the problem is a lot of the organizations that I encounter um, have really dated systems, you know, lucky to have a data warehouse, if anything. Very few of them have a dynamic data repository that would enable machine learning and AI to actually work. And all these things we're talking about, uh, you know, throwing away historical data sets because they don't matter and, you know, trying to come up with new models now. Honestly, uh, that part isn't that, that hard once you've created that infrastructure to start testing like weekly or daily or hourly, getting feedback, creating a real reinforcement type learning environment. So that's, I, I honestly think that, you know, in years of trying to sell AI and, you know, in some instances successful, but honestly, in some cases, I've realized that a lot of companies aren't there yet. And where they really are is in this understanding their data, data governance, data structuring part of the business. And getting that right uh, makes all of the fun things that we're talking about on this panel much easier. So it's just something that you know I figured it would be important to bring up. So I don't know what my fellow panelists have to say about that. But I've just found it to be like really where we are in terms of this technology. But I'd love to hear what you guys think. Yeah, well, great question. I definitely agree with, with Alan. We've been you know, working with enterprises now for, uh, we're about a four-year-old startup and uh, just the, the state of the data is, is not you know, where, where it needs to be, but the data is there. And I think that when enterprises realize they have the data somewhere, I mean, unfortunately it's been relegated to the basement or the equivalent, yeah. um, which is the ERP systems and, and other things where they, they don't look at a lot. That's where, um, a lot of the value is, especially when predicting customers. I mean, a lot of the companies are talking about not using static data, but using dynamic data. And that's where the dynamic data is as a, a big part of it. And so we've just recently, we've, we've kind of invested in technology that um, does a, basically does for data what uh, packet switching does for uh, circuit switching in telecom, which is break it all up and then allow you to, to mix it up and um, this is on our roadmap. It's it's uh, it's it's nearly done, and it's basically we call it the steam engine, and it atomizes all the data so that you don't have to ha you know spend a lot of time. You spend a year building a data lake or uh, implementing a new cloud data platform. You can use your existing data, and so uh, and, and to get value. And so that's where I think data needs to go because a lot of companies are probably we run into them. They say you know we got to do this data lake implementation. We'll come back to you, and we never see them again. And right. uh, so we want, we want to be able to get to the insights because that's what everybody wants. So the more we can help you with data and getting to the insights and not having to go spend all this capital on, on redoing cloud data warehouses into cloud data platforms, et cetera, that's where it's going to be better. So focusing on the insights is really where you're going to get the value and all the things that you want about upselling, churn reduction, et cetera. 
Yeah, I, I would agree uh, with Arun. I think that's, there's no such thing as good data or clean data. It's always dirty. It's always bad. <laughs> uh, but being able to work with it is, is, I think, what's critical. And I also agree with the automation. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies that have spent a lot of time trying to put in relationships, and then they have to undo them or, or then say that they have a lot of work to do to, to put a new relationship into the data set versus holding it atomically. And that's what we do at Profit Isles. We drive everything to the atomic level. So we take the raw data out of the transaction systems like ERP systems, GL systems, and any other raw data that they have and use it as atomically as possible. So I think those are some of the techniques that allow companies to immediately move into action and not spend a lot of time solving problems. And the last point I'd make is that a lot of companies try to, um, what I say is solve the corner cases. If you find companies that are trying to sort of get everything to align perfectly, you know that they're never going to get out of the morass. They have to develop these techniques to zip through and let those corner cases float because if they try to solve it, they're, they're never going to get out of their own way. Rebecca, I think you're on mute. But I'll oh, take yeah, Tomer, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the conversation here goes in the right direction. You know, data is accessible. Everyone got you know, a lot of problems with their data. There's no easy way to just get it out. We're trying to provide this technology to enable it. We also see whether it's in Dubai, Singapore, London, and New York, that people are looking at artificial intelligence and new capabilities still with a little bit of hesitation about what does it include? Is it a warehousing data? We need to comply. Is it everything that we need to work on, et cetera? And I think the groups here and definitely the technologies that I've seen here in this panel offer different perspective on how to access it in a more simple manner. Not, don't go to an overhauling approach of you know, restructuring your data and complete the organization, but start with some use cases and capability to make it happen. The aspect I want to bring is the area of um, data privacy and concern about sharing data. And I think it's an element that we've seen often happening, mostly in the European market, but also you know, proliferating beside is how do you work with it? The data, whether you have an on prem solution or cloud, and the ability to run some kind of uh, analytics or keep this privacy aspect is becoming critical. We use the science of social physics, but there is a lot of different approaches on how to go around this one, and I think it's becoming more and more interesting. How do you approach data? How do you provide analytics and AI while still keeping privacy as a key factor? Yeah, I think just to, just to add to that point, I think as maybe the people listening on this call and making these decisions, uh, what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling is like there's a whole uh, ecosystem around the fun stuff, right? The predicting, like all that, right? Like the, the to, to Tomer's point, uh, the gov like data governance, security, privacy, it's really important. But honestly, I've been, you know, I've had nine month procurement processes and that's not even that long, like sometimes longer. So in nine months, the world can change completely, right? So being nimble and finding some faster ways to work with kind of transitioning to like, how do you work with a smaller company like one of us out here um, and do it effectively? If you can figure that out, um, you're way ahead of the game because there's honestly very few multinationals that have figured this out, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, what about, uh, following up on that point, Alan, uh, what about the, uh, the, the customers you've seen that work well with uh, you startups? Like, yeah. How are they doing differently to enable yeah. things to happen? Because I do feel with large companies, a fair amount of inertia, there's a lot of interest that you can see from our audience, but how do we translate that to action? Yeah, no doubt. I think the ones that it works well is when right at the very top, there's buy-in, right? And, and what that really means um, is that like one great example is Allianz Life, one of our customers. Why they were great is because they understood we weren't um, uh, you know, a thousand person company and their procurement process uh, was actually a lightweight version for startups so that at least we could get in, take some data, show, like, have some proof that our stuff actually works. And then later we can go through a much you know, longer process to figure that out. But they had a really good system in place, but that only happened because all the C-levels were bought in. Um, to, uh, that was okay. And that's not, you know, that's the exception, not the rule, unfortunately. Anuj? 
Yeah, uh, I'm just adding to that, um, you know, I, I think the lightweight procurement model is great. I'm seeing more and more companies, you know, try to adopt that, but but certainly not enough. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but uh, I always like to see where can we start, right? Where can we, you know, help come in and add value? And, and back to the, you know, data conversation, um, I think a lot of companies are doing, you know, fairly well, at least at federating data. So, you know, data lakes and, you know, uh, I was part of the first implementation of Hadoop in 2004. So we have, you know, now 16 years since Hadoop was interested uh, or, or introduced into enterprise where, you know, companies have become more adept at, at at least centralizing their data. Where they, where I think they're still struggling is, is trying to get that data to those individual business units for specific, you know, functions, um, and, and it's there where the ontological data model still exists. So if we're trying to build something for churn or trying to build something for your you know, tech support organization or your finance group or your customer success, those are all areas where you know, we want to move data from the big data lake to a data pond. And in those data ponds, that's where you add more filters. That's where you add more rigor. That's where you add more structure and relationship. That's where you want to invest your time because the data lake uh, in, in, in our opinion, is going to be an intractable problem. Uh, as enterprises, we're generating more data each year than all of the years combined previously, um, you know, or at least in, in the last 18 months. So with that, you know, structuring and organizing the bigger data is always going to be harder. Um, but, you know, understanding the use cases, understanding the main expertise in each one of the business units and filtering and atomizing and, and then, you know, reconstituting those atoms into molecules that can be used in those business units individually to serve their needs and interests. That's where, you know, you want to invest your time in relationships and ontological models that, uh, you know, still do serve a purpose, but, you know, I think in the future has to be more concentrated on the goals of each business unit. Thank you, Anuj. Uh, I do want to mention for all the startups as we wrap up this, uh, this uh, panel, uh, that if you want to follow up with the, uh, these startups on how to better engage your customers, uh, do use the uh, bit.ly URL I just put into the chat. So it's bit.ly slash management startups, big M, big S 2020. Um, yeah, thank you uh, all for uh, a great panel. Any last word, last uh, sentence you want to mention to, us, to the corporates in terms of engagement with customers? One word of advice, um, we, we partner strongly with uh, MasterCard and many organizations have their own kind of uh, program to access and work with startups that have filtered the noise, let's say. So whatever you are in the world and whatever industry, um, you know, working with those organizations and finding kind of a program like MasterCard has a start path program that helps with, with startups and engagement. Um, MetLife have their own kind of a call up that really filter hundreds of those. Find the one that helps you within the organization <clears throat> and build an umbrella so they can overcome the complexity of getting an organization. Uh, you know, we close, you know, SOWs within a week with some of them just because we have this umbrella of MasterCard in some of those organizations. So I'm sure many of my partners here and colleagues are doing very similar things. Uh, just find a way to make it easier because then you can see huge success. Wait, uh, John and Arun. Yeah, actually, we're also in the MasterCard program, and it was a good program. So yeah, I, I would second that. And uh, there's a uh, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of things can be done to reduce the timeline and make just make it easier. And yeah, like like Alan said, it requires the top level. It has to it has to be there. Great. Thank you, our panelists, uh, for very thoughtful uh, advice and. Um, uh, hard one experience, I'm sure, on how to make it work uh, using you know, wrestling with the data to get the insights that, that your customers need. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Thank Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.